Andy, my dude, have you heard of the magical website builder known as Squarespace? Ugh, not another Squarespace ad. I feel like every podcast is sponsored by them. <laughs> Hey, don't knock it till you try it. Yes, okay, it is overhyped. But actually, it lives up to the hype. Squarespace is like a website fairy godmother. With a click of a button, your site transforms into a beautiful masterpiece. A website fairy godmother? That sounds interesting. What makes it so magical? Well, for starters, those slick templates make anyone look like a professional web designer. Pick one, customize the colors and fonts to match your brand, and voila! Plus, the drag-and-drop fluid engine is so easy, your grandma could build a site on Squarespace. Well, she did knit me a lovely scarf last Christmas. Maybe website design is next. Exactly. And when you're ready to sell your Nana's handmade scarves online, Squarespace has built-in e-commerce. Add a store with one click. Get flexible payment options. Then watch those sales roll in. And when she wants to teach others her steezy scarf skills, Squarespace's new courses feature is just the ticket. Nana can set up her curriculum and enrollments and payments in a snap and become the next e-knitting influencer. Oh, wow, you really sold me with the grandma angle. Sign me up for that free try. Just go to the nextreel.com slash Squarespace and transform your site into a beautiful Squarespace masterpiece. Well, thanks, Pete. Even though it's overhyped, Squarespace actually sounds perfect for Nana's site's needs. Appreciate the warning on the ads, though. I'll brace myself next time I listen to a podcast. Anytime. Let me know if you need any help getting that site up and running. Andy, can you believe we've almost hit 700 episodes of The Next Reel? I know, it's crazy. And with all the other episodes in our family of podcasts, we are well over 1,200 episodes of movie conversation. It's really pretty amazing that we've gotten to have these in-depth movie chats every week for over a decade now. And we couldn't have done it without our loyal community of film fans. Their support over the years has meant so much. For sure. That reminds me, we should give the merch store a shout out. Buying shirts from thenextreel.com slash merch is a great way listeners can continue to support the show. Plus, they get to sport our great designs. Absolutely. I think sometimes folks forget we have a variety of shirts, mugs, phone cases, and more available. In fact, a great place to start is with a shirt sporting the Next Reel's logo. We also have that classic Fast Times Spicoli Surf School tee, or the weirdly popular Rusty's European Tour shirt. The one from National Lamp Foods European Vacation. Why is that so popular? <laughs> Search me, but we have sold a ridiculous number of those. I guess there are a lot of Rusties taking trips to Europe? We're always adding new designs based on movies we've covered, like our brand new design for a streetcar named Desire, featuring a streetcar named Desire. So if you want to rep your love of TNR and films, head to thenextreel.com slash merch. Every purchase helps us continue to have these weekly in-depth conversations. So visit thenextreel.com slash merch today. And as always, thanks for listening and being a part of the Next Real community. We've got lots more great movie chats coming your way. I'm Pete Wright. And I'm Andy Nelson. Welcome to The Next Reel. When the movie ends, our conversation begins. Robin Hood, Prince of Thieves is over, so it's time to split the arrow. A time of war. A time of homecoming. A time of tyrants. A time when the only way to uphold justice was to break the law. The one man who stood for freedom became a legend. Kevin Costner, Morgan Freeman, Christian Slater, Alan Rickman, and Mary Elizabeth Mastrantonio. Robin Hood, Prince of Thieves. Andy, we're still doing this Robin Hood thing. I don't know if you noticed that, but these movies that we watch, they're still related to Robin Hood. And I'm wondering if this was uh, our best judgment at work. Well, it depends on your opinion <laughs> of the movie. But uh, yeah, I mean, it's a lot of Robin Hood. It is Oof. a lot of Robin Hood. Oh, I don't think dear. I have as much of an issue as some people of just watching the same thing over and over again. I mean, I do, if it literally is the same thing over and over again. <laughs> Yes, but this is not. This is definitely not the same thing over there. It, it's uh, similar, but not congruent, as we like to say. 
I find um, this one in particular uh, is the one I, I think I'd been looking forward to the most because it's the one I had the most sort of youthful connection to. You know, I it came out when I was, I don't know, did I want to be Robin Hood? I don't know. It kind of felt like it. Uh, Michael Kamen's score uh, really gave me a nice rush. And uh, so I got, I was really looking forward to it. I'm excited to hear how this movie uh, attached to you as we uh, get into it. But first, I would like to tell you about a legend, just a legend to open us up, a wee legend that I found circa 1261 from a Cambridge professor in my research this week. A real bona fide Cambridge professor. Would you like to hear it? Would I? Would I? Circa 1261. It turns out Robin Hood, H O D, was used in early crime reports as the equivalent of John Doe from people who were arrested or somehow being punished for crime. Their names would be stripped from them and they would be called Robin Hood. And that is the, some of the first documented uh, reportage that there is, there has been a, a legend of Robin Hood, but they were all straight up criminals. And the whole stealing from the rich and then giving to the poor, the giving to the poor part, that didn't enter the legend for another 200 years, Andy. John Doe, in another 200 years, might be one of our greatest benefactors. It's interesting. And it does make me wonder. I mean, this is one of those things. No one is yeah. ever really going to know. You know, well, the people except for this guy in Cambridge. He seems pretty oh, sure. He seemed, right, exactly. <laughs> but I mean, the people who live in Nottingham, like they are all on yeah. board with the realities of it. There's little John's grave. And they say, oh, Robin and Marion used to come in this bar all the time in the olden days. Right. You know, and so it's, it's funny. I, I love that uh, there will always be these these, uh, you know, debates about stuff like this. And I I am very curious because it does seem like the sort of thing that could be kind of, uh, you know, like another word to call someone instead of rapscallion, we'll call him Robin Hood. Yeah. Who knows why? But it's, it's an interesting element that does kind of stick to these people. And uh, I like that it has turned into this mythical story. And I think, you know, I don't know if we've talked about kind of just the the place of this particular story in context of, of history. But I think the whole idea of robbing from the rich and giving to the poor, I think that is such a huge reason as to why Robin Hood has persisted for so long, because I think people like that idea. And I think the world will sadly probably always be in a place where <laughs> where people feel like they need to rob from the rich to give to the poor because uh, the rich are always robbing from everybody um <laughs> <laughs> always robbing from everybody those rich you know it, it's a story that we need <clears throat> culturally it's a story yeah. that's important for us to be able to lean on in, when times are dark politically economically like this is the kind of story that we need and it's just like we there are stories that we need you know we need star wars right we need the triumph of the un, of, of the little guy and and we need the matrix right we need john wick good lord do we ever need vengeance stories uh, and again those can be applied both politically and economically and that's what robin hood is and has been for over a hundred years, certainly of filmmaking and generation after generation of storytelling. That is what we're going to continue to talk about as we dig into Kevin Costner, old two by four himself, as Robin Hood, Robin of the Hood, Prince mm. of the Thieves. Mm hmm. <laughs> This week's show is once again brought to you by you, but here's how you can be a big part of it. You can head over to our merch page at Tee Public. Uh, Tee Public is so great. You know why? Because we have our original stuff up there where you can get our, our logo shirts and, and stickers. You can get our uh, brand new I Am Patient Zero shirts and stickers. Uh, if, if you don't know what that is, you know what? That, what how would you define the, the Patient Zero, Andy? Uh, Patient Zero is kind of something that started in our Discord chat groups. Uh, if somebody is talking about a movie that they watched and nobody else has seen it, but their excitement about that movie has spurred a bunch of people randomly to all of a sudden go and watch that film. They have that's become right. Patient Zero for that movie. They become Patient Zero for that movie, and that's kind of taken off a little bit. So we made a shirt out of it, and uh, it's up there. You can get that one. You can also get, this is why I really love Tee Public because uh, we have added a whole bunch of original art uh, that is uh, Robin Hood art. Robin Hood 
fun comic art, movie art, lots of great art uh, that you can buy if, uh, through our page. And when you buy a shirt or a sticker or whatever you want, uh, uh, Robin Hood, great Robin Hood stuff, uh, then uh, the original artist gets uh, gets a piece of that, which is it's fun. It's a great way to support uh, the creative economy. So check that out. We still have our Tony Stark, our Iron Man stuff up from our Marvel Movie Minute season last season, but boy, are we putting together art for the Hulk. So if you want to get ahead of it, go get some, I mean, there's some fantastic Iron Man stuff going on right now uh, in that on that page. There's the really cool half silhouette that'd be great on a phone case. You get all sorts of great stuff. So you can check it all out at uh, over at thenextreel.com slash merch. Go get some stuff. Thanks for your support. We appreciate you uh, doing that and wearing the next reel. You're the best. Call your mother. Kevin Costner, Andy, do, should we start with the Kevin Costner conversation? Is that is that where we should start? <laughs> I have one question before we start jumping into Kevin Costner. Okay. Um, relating to what we were just talking about as far as uh, the timeliness of the story and how people need it. Do you feel, and this is off topic, I am aware, relative, somewhat. Do you feel that the filmmakers behind the recent Taron Egerton, Jamie Foxx, Robin Hood film failed in finding the way to connect it, that version of the story to the world as it is at this moment <laughs> when they told their version of the story? It's a little bit of a rhetorical question because I kind of know <laughs> the answer. <laughs> I feel like there were turns that could have been taken that would have made it more foundational to our current cu- cultural dialogue. Is Indeed. that fair? That's With, fair. Noting <laughs> that we're not talking about the movie as part of this series. We Correct. Will, I just blessedly, we up. will stop before yes. we get there. <laughs> it's what I like to call, I finished that movie and said, huh, that is an expanded universe, Robin Hood universe. <laughs> they're it not was. on, they're not here. It's not historical. Yeah. Yeah. They are kind of in the, uh, it, it's as if the um, Robin Hood world was a part of the A Knight's Tale world. A Knight's you know, Tale. And, no, yeah, you're right. It's you're a right. Knight's Tale uh, expanded universe. I was thinking actually something different, and now I've I've forgotten uh, exactly what the name of it was. was. That Wachowski movie with the flying dog person? Uh, Jupiter Ascending, uh, where Channing Jup- Tatum was a flying dog. Jupiter Ascending. So it, I actually feel like there is a way <laughs> to connect <laughs> Jupiter Ascending as the future state of Taron Egerton's <laughs> Robin Hood. <laughs> That's probably better to say than A Knight's Tale, because A Knight's Tale was actually a good movie. <laughs> it's right. It, it was a con- sort of, uh, you know, a contemporary, right? Yeah. More or less. Yeah. 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 All right. Anyway, back anyway, on topic. Anyway. Kevin Costner. How'd he do for you? Yeah, okay. So you yeah, have probably See, you're Kevin already Costner. girding yourself for battle. I can hear it. it that's true. I'm embracing myself. <laughs> you have issues with Kevin Costner. I generally enjoy Kevin Costner. Yes, sometimes he's a little... Uh, a little flatter than other performers. What would you say um, he's as flat as? <laughs> I'm not going there. And I think that um, I appreciate that he acknowledged um, when he was trying to do an accent for this film. <laughs> and he just acknowledged, I'm just not good at it. And chose to not do an English accent because he knew that would make the movie worse if he tried. I appreciate that. I think that maybe means that he wasn't the right candidate to play Robin Hood. <laughs> Is that possible? I don't think so. I actually really like him in this movie. I I like this movie actually quite a bit. I'm just going to say it. I have a lot of fun with this movie. I think that he's fine. I really do think that he's fine in this movie. Sure, if it had been somebody <laughs> else, uh, I'm sure that it could have felt a little more um, spot on, but I I don't know. Maybe it's because I saw this at a point in time where it just hit me and I really liked it. And um, I was actually kind of nervous going into this because I hadn't seen it probably since college Mm -hmm. and uh, which was right around when it came out. And um, it but it largely worked and I had fun with it. And I can see why people would have issues with him, but it still didn't bug me having him in it. All right. Well, I'm going to say some things that surprise you, and I'm also going to continue to badmouth the performance throughout the evening. But I will say some things to open up that will surprise you. Number one, as long as he wasn't opening his mouth, I actually quite enjoyed him in this movie. Uh, 
I think that he, uh, I, I think he physically was pretty good. I didn't, I, the, there are some things about the performance and particularly the production and character design. We'll say the character design that don't hold up. That mullet, man, that mullet was a short sighted hairstyle, uh, for even for the nineties that, that should have been rectified early and, and, um, with, with many haircuts often frequently throughout the production. That didn't fly. It's not but, quite a mullet. It's mm, not quite. It's not business in the front. It's just, it's kind of party all over. No, I I think it was a mullet. I think it was it's, a mullet. We might need a judge's ruling on this, but I'm going to go all in on mullet. There was definitely a party in the back and not yes. as much party in the front. And you would notice that particularly when he got wet. And I don't know if you know this, he was wet a lot in this movie. There was a lot of wet Costner. <laughs> Sometimes it was wet and muddy Costner. Sometimes it was wet and just, you know, Lake Costner, but it was a lot of wet. Um, you forgot naked Costner. Sometimes yeah, it was yeah. naked, <laughs> naked, wet Costner. Uh, yes, there was a lot of wet. But but I did, I do think he had some really great, I mean, this is a movie that's made up of great moments, great cinematic moments. And I think it's a movie that excels at, at short cinematic moments, right? Great framing. Uh, so there are some things that are, that are I, I think, are really fun about it. It didn't hold up as well as, I, as I'd hoped that it would. Uh, there are some things that I just found it too easy to take myself out of, which was frustrating. O- overall, I enjoyed it, and I think it is too maligned today. I really do. I think the that there are people who are like the what I've been reading about sort of others who have revisited the film in the last twenty years who are aggressively against this movie, and I think that's unfair. I think it's an, an unfair judgment of the movie. The stuff I'm talking about is just silly. It's silly stuff that I, I should have caught in 1991. I, I didn't, but. I should. I I mean, there are issues, but I think what I find with this film as I watch it is I think that the team put together a just a romping good time and they clearly are having fun with it. And they made a film that is um, allowing itself to have fun, even when it gets really violent, because there are. I, it's really been an interesting series as far as like the violence levels in Robin Hood that I forget about. But it's like, wow, there's a lot of violence in Robin Hood. And certainly they hold up their end of the deal here because there is some real violent stuff here. But generally, the way that it's handled on screen is done in a way where it's it's like just happening just off screen or it happens kind of in a shady area or something. And so you never really see it. A lot of it is just kind of in your head. And generally, it's done in a way where there's still kind of, most of the time, kind of a sense of humor with it. So it ends up, I don't know, the whole thing just feels very light and fun and uh, quite enjoyable. I had I had a good time with it. It's funny because as I watched it, though, I was like, because I was going to watch it with my kids. And then I watched it. And I'm like, OK, so there they probably could have gone through it without too many things. But like then you have like Alan Rickman basically trying to to rape Mary Elizabeth Master Antonio in the chapel right after they get married. You know, there are some scenes I'm like, <clears throat> maybe, you know, I would, I would like to maybe offer just a brief correction for the kids. It was actually the sheriff of Nottingham and Maid Marian. I yeah. don't think the two actors were ever trying to <laughs> violate one another. Yes, their characters. Excuse me. Yes. <laughs> Uh, well, I would. I, how would you like to approach this? Because the way I, I have it in my head, we have the the Robin Hood lore, the handling of of what it means to be a Robin Hood movie, and I did want to talk about the the uh, issues that have come up around the director's cut and the differences between the director's cut and the theatrical cut, and uh, because I know both of us watched the the extended cut uh, for this viewing. And that was new to us. So I wanted to talk a little bit about what that brought, because there were some changes to it that that I found surprising. So where do you want to start? Let's start there. I had no memory from the theatrical. I've seen this movie a lot of times. I ha- owned this movie in college, a little VHS tab. It was in my shelf and I would put it on occasionally and watch it. And I so I, I've seen it enough times to to at least remember, um, you know, the the bones of the story. And. I did not remember quite how heavily there was a uh, the story of like paganism and the witchcraft and that the all the the stuff down in the basement. And I know that the story was there, but it was not it was not central. And so a lot of of what was added back was it helped to continue to like lean in or frame this discussion of uh the sheriff of Nottingham and his occult you know underbelly literally under the castle, um, where it turns out his mother 
lives. So we have lots of uh, witchy stuff. We have the eyes in the wall. Um, we have the sheriff now eating the raw meat. And, you know, that, that whole sequence with the intestines was nice and gross. Um, he cuts out the scribe's tongue, uh, at least not, we don't actually see it, but he's, that is a directive of, of the witch. Um, so there's a lot of the occult stuff. How did that impact your viewing of the movie this time? Well, I remembered it being in there. I just couldn't remember how much. And, and certainly there was, uh, quite a bit in this. Um, but instantly when the film started and, um, well, I shouldn't say right away, but once we go to, to England and we see, uh, Robin's father, getting uh, attacked basically and and right. uh, set upon by Rickman and his men and uh, and killed um I was like oh this must be new because I don't remember any of this but it wasn't like that was in the film right. and right. it had Rickman in his hoods it's like it was almost like a pre KKK sort of rally out in front of um Loxley's manor and it was very strange and I was like gosh this, and then I was looking it up just like you like what changes did they make and I'm like that was in it yeah, I totally don't remember a lot of that stuff. I remember the witch, I and I remember elements of it, but I don't remember nearly that much of it. And so it was a real surprise to me to see how much of that kind of that path these writers took to really do something with the sheriff that we had never seen before, where he really is kind of a member of the occult based on the teachings of this witch who lives in the basement. That, And it's actually in the extended edition that we find out that it's his mother so we never even would have known that it was his mother it just would always have seemed like this witch that had raised him um, based on his parents wishes so that was another interesting shift and so i i think it's actually a really interesting element to give to the story especially to the sheriff of nottingham you know where we really are kind of fleshing him out in a really interesting way that i found uh, kind of just uh, a welcome change, you know, is something that was really unique. Well, it, it was it was unique and it was fun, particularly because they had such a strong performer in Alan Rickman to be able to pull mm. off all this stuff, and they had yeah. some really clever, just uh, you know, uh, camera uh, use for both him and Gisborne. The way they are they are shot in the the castle and the way the occult stuff is shot, uh, I, I think is is unique and it gives us a, a truly different perspective than we get in the the wooded lush you know stuff of of Robin Hood. I think there's a challenge. Even the laser though. light. <laughs> Yeah, right. <laughs> right. Or laser backlighting. Yeah. 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 Like, right. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. It's a little. <laughs> yeah. That was the that was the girls ask guys skate at uh, the roller rink. Um, yes. But but I think there is a challenge to the narrative there because I think that as they brought that material back, right, and and one of the sequences that they bring back in particular was the occult, like the mass of the barons, right, where where all the barons are there and they're over the big pagan star and they are holding their hands out. It's it's really the precursor to Snape as a Death Eater, and uh, and so they're he's give he's paying them off right um uh, nottingham is paying them off it the movie i think as it is never really makes clear enough the relationship between these barons who are they what are they doing and why the sheriff is is uh, you know putting all of this into place why does he need the witch to make all this happen like it it feels just sort of manufactured and shoved in there together i love what it allows rickman to do as an actor i think it's really fun but i'm not sure it adds to the story yeah that's an interesting point i mean it's a lot of uh, creepy gothic weirdness that's going on but yeah how i mean Without it, we still have the story of him trying to pay these barons a lot of money so that they uh, side against King Richard, right? And he can usurp the throne, basically. I mean, that's that's really what the whole mission is that he has here. So, yeah, that's a good question. What does this occultish activity end up bringing to that part of the story? And that is not ever really defined, right? You could excise mother. You could you could take out mother and all of the sequences in the dungeon and you could still have and the barons and all of that weird KKK stuff. And you would still have a right fun good versus bad guy 
uh, sequence. Now, I did read it was interesting that that uh, Alan Rickman had been approached twice to do this movie, uh, and he had declined twice until the third time they said, you can have carte blanche with the character, you can do whatever you want. And so I wonder just how much influence he had directly on, you know, the direction of weirdness that goes on in the belly of that castle, because, you know, clearly he was having a good time. I mean, I don't think he was rewriting the script. I think it's just how he directed his performance. Yeah. And so, right. um, you know, I and clearly he is having a lot of fun, like you said. It's, it, he's having so much fun. It just, I, I think that's why the film ends up being really fun. Because otherwise, if he's not having fun and uh, the just kind of like the, the tone becomes so dark and... And kind of potentially gory and gruesome, because if if this is the sort of tale it is, but he's just a very serious guy. I mean, it is like all of a sudden, like just a really dark story. And I don't think anyone wants that. They want to have fun. And so he clearly knew that. And they rightfully allowed him to have the fun that brought this character to life quite a bit. It's a great exercise in, uh, you know. Uh, conflict, like tonal conflict, right? Where you have this guy who is the bad guy and he's doing terrible things, but he's the guy we're laughing at. And and uh, to do it in a way that isn't a lampoon of the sheriff, but is actually like, we can take this character seriously and he is still performing, you know, humorously. I think it's, I think it actually works, works really well. That's a, that's a piece that definitely holds up. The other bits, uh, there's one other major scene I think that was, that was struck, which is the, uh, 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 his trip to the dungeon, which I think was smart to cut. He goes into the dungeon and he's captured all the merry men and he's going to each one and he says, what do you want, death or pain? And it doesn't matter what they choose, whether it's death or pain, they get torture and pain. So um, it's like he's having a little terrible, stupid game show uh, and it, it just doesn't, it, it doesn't work. Uh, it, it's neither funny nor particularly threatening. It's just... Um, a poor exercise of character ego that doesn't, I don't think it plays very well. Yeah. I, I don't think it necessarily was, um, uh, needed in any way. Uh, it's okay, I guess. And and then that c extends, I think a little bit more with, um, when he's talking with will as well. So there's right. a little more to meet to that conversation and I'm fine with that element, but yeah, this first part of it, again, it's just more, entertaining footage of Alan Rickman being just deliciously evil, but it isn't right. really that necessary. The last batch of movies we've been talking about, the buddy part of the movie is typically Robin Hood and Little John. And we have a great Little John uh, in this movie played by Nick Brimble, but he is not the buddy. Uh, the buddy has been uh, shifted to Morgan Freeman playing Azim, who is uh, a fellow prisoner from the Crusades, uh, an infidel, and... Uh, he is, they escape together, Robin and Azim, and uh, they make their way back to England together. Uh, how did this change to the lore hit you? Does it, does it work? It's one of those things where it feels like modern storytellers saying, you know, we need to f infuse this with a little more, you know, PC storytelling. Um, let's bring an African-American actor in. How can we do that? Hey, he's down in Jerusalem. Uh, fighting these these people, let's have uh, him befriend a Moor and have him come along. Um, so that's kind of the whole setup of it. Um, but the thing is, it works. I, I you know, I, I guess I don't end up having a problem with it because I don't know if it's just because the way Morgan Freeman plays him or just the the way that he's written. But I think it's actually it works really well in context of the story. There's a reason for it. There's a reason that he comes to England because he basically has a life debt. So he's, you know, he and Chewbacca are in the same camp. <laughs> and and so he's just kind of following along well, well and he'll, he'll do what he needs to do to help him out. And um but I think what I uh, what I like so much about him is he's not there just to basically be the sidekick and do what he needs to do. He's kind of like half there and half not, which I think is actually one of the reasons that it works so well. Like the first time that Robin sees these uh, men, Guy of Gisborne and his men, um, setting upon a young boy for killing a, a deer, one of the one of the deer owned by the sheriff. 
uh, Robin goes and fights these guys and it keeps calling for Azim to come help and he's praying. He's too busy, so he doesn't do anything. I think that there are moments like that that end up making the whole relationship work. And I, I don't know, I just like his character arc. I think there's a lot of interesting elements. My biggest issue, and it's not a big issue, but there's this whole setup between him and the witch as far as they both know each other. Like they both have heard of each other in their... I don't know, in their vision, their rune reading or whatever yeah, it is they do. But it's like, how, like, yeah. why is that a thing? It just, because there's two exotic people, like it just, it kind of seems like this odd thing that they added just to kind of create this element of, um, uh, mystery about them that I just don't know if it was needed. Right. It, that's a, that felt super manufactured and dropped in v- way too late in the movie. Right. I mean, it was it, it, the the little pieces they added back again. Um, it it just wasn't called out enough to know that there was something important about that. Uh, certainly felt one sided um, because I don't think we had any indication from Azim's character's perspective that there was a witch that he was on the lookout for. Uh, no, he, unless I miss says, something. No, he does. He says uh, something about a witch. He's like the witch. Like the, he uh, has the same reaction about her that she has about him. When 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 I can't remember who says that he's with a, a Moorish person. She's well, clearly like, it didn't oh. make a make a strong impact yeah. on me. Right? <laughs> it's just yeah. not. Uh, it was just not um, significant. But um, I I also think that it was. I, I here's my my thinking. I don't think I would have liked this relationship as well had we not just seen all these other historical Robin Hood movies and had had invested some understanding in uh, the, you know, the Crusades and where this character Robin of Loxley has been, right? I think it works because, as you say, of the context of where he is. And Morgan Freeman is great and uh, he is funny and you know, you can make the case that there are all sorts of of weird little racist undertones in this thing, but I think you can also make the case that it's it's not a movie that's trying to be racist. It's trying, at least on a surface, to be uh, to be accurate to the period, right? To what they're trying to portray of the sentiment of of you know the time in its own completely dramatically comedically dramatized way. And in that end, I think it works. And what I think is interesting is how this is a change made in this film that we've already seen now getting adapted into later Robin Hood stories. Right. Like the most recent one that we were just talking about earlier. Right. So it's interesting how this is how these myths evolve and change with time. That's right. Then we have some of the archery stuff. If yeah. we're talking about character, can we talk about more characters first before we oh, get into yeah. the archery? I was, I was still going through my list of lore. Well, Will Scarlet is the one that I wanted to talk about because that also fits into the list of lore. Yeah, you're right. And I think that was an interesting change. Uh, I, I would say a very welcome change that they made here to give more meat to that character who's been largely undefined in all of the previous films. He's just been there. And now we have an actual, like, Will Scarlet with an interesting storyline. And I thought that was actually really cool. And I liked that. I appreciated that this was a change that they made for this story that gave that character uh, kind of just a history and made it somebody that I actually found interesting. Okay. What about the big reveal? Yeah, I'm fine with it. I thought it worked. You're fine with that? That was good? That was okay? Yeah. That's what I'm saying. I think it was a great twist that they threw in here that i'm like okay i like this as the twist to the story no, I, I, no no no. i like the twist i like the twist i like the whole concept i like the idea of giving will scarlet a uh a, a, a beefier backstory but when uh when robin grabs will and says i have a brother <laughs> i just <laughs> brother's got a hug right i mean i just <laughs> could not like that's supposed to be a big moment and it was so dumb. It was so <laughs> dumb. It was just dumb. I couldn't. I just can't. That was one of those moments that I just can't even with this movie. There are see, there are a couple of those. That's, but that's you and Costner. Ah, 
uh, me and Costner and now Slater, like, I like Christian Slater a lot, and I've never really had that reaction. And I think the problem is I've seen him in stuff recently that I like so much better that revisiting this, where I actually had a good mem- memory of it, I had a good mental image, a positive, not good, <laughs> clearly not good, a positive <laughs> mental image of of my experience with this movie. And that sequence was, it just was too much. It was a bridge too far for me. Um so I, I mean, I can acknowledge it's a little, uh, a little rough the way that it's handled. But I, I think for me, it ends up working because I buy into the the emotion and I, and I buy into that. I, I buy into the truth of that story element, and so I enjoyed that it was included. But I can see your issues with it. All right. Uh, do all the merry men? I'm going to stay on some of the merry men as we work into the merry men here. Do all okay. of the merry men just hang out on the banks? of this river like all day and wait for someone is that what they do <laughs> because so. did they have any indication that robin was coming to the river like and then they all quick quick everybody somebody's coming to the river and then they all hide so well, that they, okay so that christian slater can sing <laughs> ring around the rosy i think that they like we see later they have stakeouts they have guards and they are they're watching and so they know if people are in the woods and so they're ready for them i they buy do that they shoot arrows into the ground that's what they do yes to yeah. let people know. they, they weren't okay. shooting arrows into the ground yet because they hadn't been trained they were probably throwing rocks at each other <laughs> you know what all things being equal andy that makes the most sense uh, I actually, I, I like a lot of the Merry Men. Uh, I think Little John, as you mentioned earlier, uh, Nick Brimble's portrayal of Little John is exactly the Little John that I wanted to see. I think he's great. And man, does that guy have some eyes. Oh, I could look into those eyes all day long. Deep <laughs> blue pools. You know, it's interesting, the the change with the Merry Men. So here we have a band of Merry Men, but it's really like, a band of merry men and some of their families and stuff. And it, it, it it's kind of interesting the way that this band grew because they're all the outlaws. But as we learn. Outlaws and, and refugees. And refugees. And little John, his son is with him because his son is the one, the wanted kid who killed the, the sheriff's deer. Mm-hmm. And then there's the, but his wife is like living in town still or something like, cause they go to her door and they're asking, you know, where is he? Where is he? And all that sort of nonsense. Mm-hmm. Um, and so it's, it's interesting the way that they kind of bifurcate the families and everything in this, but then eventually like everybody just moves to the forest and it just becomes like a big right. old forest. Uh, hang on. It's like, they just basically make a new town. It's just in the forest. In Sherwood Forest. And, yeah, in Sherwood Forest. And so that was an interesting change that it became such a massive group where they basically, you know, they're the whole community is living there. And there's a point when they're, they're, I don't know, they're making a fire or something. And I'm like, it's, if the sheriff had any brains, like there are so many people there burning fire uh, you know, making cooking and whatnot, you can just look for the smoke over the tops of the trees to figure out where their camp is. Why is it so hard to find this? Well, this camp. If you if you want to start doing that, like the when they go to the town and burn the town, why does it take so many like town burnings later for them actually to decide maybe let's have a guy follow these people? Like they all leave their homes and start walking into the woods. Like, yeah, right. They're going there now. Why yeah, don't right, we follow right. them? And I put that on Guy of Gisborne that he should have. And, and the sheriff, too, because later, this is, I think, after Guy is dead, he, uh, the, and, and this is after his men have burned the, the forest sanctuary, right? And, and he's found Robin's little medallion and all of this. But then he's like, you know, he needs Will to kind of, you know, where is he? Tell me where he's hiding because he thinks he's still alive. And I'm like, right. you just burned their forest. Why don't you just go back to where they were and look around? <laughs> because lo and behold, they haven't gone anywhere. They're right <laughs> there where you just were. <laughs> yeah, this is a this is a film that has some trouble tracking uh, in terms of, you know, character paths. But. I, I should say it also is I, I feel like we need to talk about the mistaken identity trope because that's another one that's head slappingly stupid to me. 
Okay. And I'm talking specifically about our introduction to the lovely maid, Marion, played by uh, Mary Elizabeth Mastrantonio. I like her very much. Mm, uh, me too. And uh, she's just a delightful actor. And Works great she, in this film, too. Yeah. I, I love her in this film. <laughs> yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. Uh, she does great with what she's given. And it, it starts, and this is, a, I, so I watched this with my daughter, and she is irate about Marion's portrayal in this movie. I rate. She hates it. She hates it. And I'll bet you can guess why. The movie starts, the, the introduction of these two people, Robin, who is only six years older than when he left, right? Maybe let's give him a, a lot of travel time. Let's say another year of travel time uh, to get to the Crusades. Maybe seven years when he left. They were childhood friends with, with Peter and Robin, and Peter was her sister. So childhood friends you have to believe that they knew what each other looked like. And so there's this whole charade when Robin shows up at the door with the lady in waiting and she pretends to be uh, Marion. And clearly he knows that she's not Marion. That's, that is obviously telegraphed in the sequence. That's not the part I have a problem with. The part I have a problem with is that we Marion attacks him in a suit of armor and a helmet so we can't see it's her she attacks him before she ever even stopped to look at him. Why does she attack him, Andy? Why does she attack him without look, without knowing? You think she didn't notice who it was at the door? Defend this, sir. I dare you. <laughs> well, one, I, I disagree. I have always felt that he actually does think that that was Marion. <laughs> when he says the years have been kind to you? Yes, that head. I think that he's that been he gone makes? so long. Yeah, I think that he's uh, does, embarrassed to say, "Wow, you've really gone downhill." Well, it's it's just very different. It's a very very different person. You would think that he would have a mental image of that hair alone. Mary Elizabeth Mastrantonio has true. iconic this is, hair. This is a period where there are no photographs. There's no way to really n remember people as well. So. I don't I, I didn't have an issue with that element of her. And, you know, some of these elements that are in this are clearly just, you know, modern updates on the story. Like, yes. let's make Marion a little more a uh, little more of a character. Let's make her a little more aggressive. She's she can take care of herself. And so that was that whole scene. And OK, so it doesn't make a lot of sense. But I never really took it that she knew who it was or that she believed that it was Robin, you know. And so, you know, I don't know. I guess I, I find I think it you're easy being, to forget. One, I think you're being too gracious to the film. And two, <laughs> this is the central failing that my daughter pulled apart, that you are exactly right. They updated this, this Marion to make her stronger, more independent, more fierce, all of the great things uh, that we want out of this character. And then they absolutely pull all of those things away at the end, where she becomes another helpless damsel. And that was enormously yeah. frustrating. That is a betrayal of the character that they set up. And that is a more egregious failing of the character than the mistaken identity stuff that has been, that has been stupid in every other movie that we've talked about, right? <laughs> Whatever you make of it, it it's been silly. And uh, in, this, in this film, it's actually like he, he can't see who she is, so... That at least is believable. It, he could believe he's just fighting another knight, and I assume that he believes that. Uh, but she should have known better. That's that's I think the part that's frustrating. But what they do to the character, I think, is is um, that's the most frustrating. Yeah, I agree that that's frustrating. I still hold it that there's no way that she necessarily knew it was Robin, or that she would trust it was Robin. And I don't think that she would have seen him. So I think she was just being cautious. I find that forgivable. But you're right. The way that they, they end up treating the character over the course of the film becomes uh, a lot more frustrating. And by yeah. the time we get to the end and she's nothing other than a damsel in distress, then it's it's pretty uh, it's pretty frustrating that that's where we ended with that character. It's all because she saw him naked. And that is the reason that we need to wear clothes more, <laughs> because people make stupid changes in their lives when they see each other naked. So. <laughs> That's clearly what this movie is a message about, is less nudity. And you know, when she saw him in that lake, they lingered on her face. They wanted you to know the transformation that was happening inside her head at the sign of nudity. What's funny about that is I did not remember that <laughs> there were... 
three other people there with her. Right. Like, I totally, in my, <laughs> I'm like, I thought it was just her, but no, her, her lady in waiting is there and there are two of his guys there. <laughs> it's just like a whole thing. I totally yeah. forgot that. It's actually funny to watch. Whole and actually that immunity. was, that was actually a scene that reminded me of what life was like in the nineties when a, a a hot hunk of a naked man on screen was not like some buff bodybuilder. Like, it, cause it, you see Kevin and you're like, oh, he looks just so normal looking. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know? <laughs> oh, bless the 90s. <laughs> Let's only watch those movies. <laughs> uh, uh, okay. Let's, we got to move this along, but I, I, I feel like uh, we got the mistaken identity. We got, we, she, she actually uses the title of the film in the script and I, you know, that's a button for me. Robin of the Hood, Prince of Thieves. Ugh. Yes. Whatever. We'll move on. But it's there. I feel like this movie needs a notch. She, she also says, I'll do it for you, which Ugh. is straight out of the song. So, Oh, God. Uh, it's just <laughs> insufferable. Uh, <laughs> Guy Gisborne, Michael this, Wincott. This is, is, awesome. this is a perfect example of like what Hollywood does. And in this case, I would say it's doing it in a way that works for a Hollywood movie. It is. It's a great. And you know what? I watched some some uh, uh, period interviews of Kevin Costner pitching, doing his pressers for this thing. And he says it exactly right. I feel like we made a great movie. This is going to be a great thing to do on a Friday or Saturday night. He's yeah. exactly right. This was a great thing to do on a Friday or Saturday night. And uh, and, and so I, pulling it apart like this does a disservice to to it as a piece of popcorn entertainment because it absolutely lives up to that. Uh, that we've got some funny characters. Michael Wincott is fantastic as as Guy Gisborne. Uh, they make him so ineffectual. I think it's it's terrific and funny. Uh, that was something I forgot about how little there is of Guy Gisborne in this yeah. film. I mean, he's there, but he really just is like Tertiary a supporting character, character who, right. yeah, very much um, ends relatively yeah. quickly. What else is important to you here? I feel like well, I've been dominating. So we, that's okay. Sometimes, sometimes you sometimes like you need to be, to be, the be one. dominated dominating <laughs> here's a big question for you because we have one big change in this story that we haven't talked about at all but it's the biggest change i think in the robin hood lore in the fact that we have completely eliminated prince john he is not even mentioned in this film there's no apparently no prince john in fact the sheriff is just trying to usurp um the king himself and so it's it's a it's a really interesting shift that they have kind of taken this story and they've basically kind of condensed their villains to just the sheriff. And so uh, does that work for you to eliminate that character? Would it have worked if they made it made um, uh, Alan Rickman's character uh, the prince instead of the the way that they took it i know it would shift the story quite a bit but uh, i mean what are your thoughts no oh, i i really like it and and in fact this was because this was some of my earliest like formative experience with robin hood this is what i thought i i remembered as the the actual story all the other investigation that we've been doing that kind of talks about the the betrayal of prince john and the king that was news to me. Like, I just didn't, I, I hadn't thought about it that hard. And so uh, I, I feel like that does work. It was the king. He was he was gone and the sheriff stepped in his power. I think it simplifies uh, a, a lot of the the political narrative that we we just don't need when really what we want is that Friday or Saturday night popcorn experience with, with some great, funny, diabolical performers. I mean, he's a real mustache twisting guy. And and I think it um, it, it works not to muddy it up with a second villain. Um, and uh, I find I prefer it. And and you prefer him being the sheriff rather than just yeah. Prince John? Well, and it, it's interesting that you say that, too, because, you know, you find that other Robin Hood stories find other ways to simplify, right? Either they make the sheriff a nebbishy, you know, dummy um, right. who doesn't have much of a part. So in the end, it becomes a Guy of Gisborne, Prince John story. Uh, and in this one, we have a sheriff of Nottingham, Guy of Gisborne story. And and yeah. so all of these, I think, have tried to do the same thing that I'm suggesting is central to our ability to keep the story clean, which is eliminate some of the bad guys. Because when there are too many bad guys, it, you lose track. 
it gets to be a little much. And uh, unless you do what they didn't hear, where you pair them with other people. So, yeah. so, you know, we had Robin paired with the sheriff. We had Azim paired with the witch. And, you know, by, by creating those kind of situations, um, it helps you kind of, you know, kind of categorize who's fighting who. Mm-hmm. So I like it. I do like it also. I, I think that it's actually a nice change to the story. Okay, so if if we're talking about historical accuracy, which, of course, the Robin Hood tale isn't really historically accurate, um, but in context of, you know, the king and his brother, which we've talked about before, that's, you were kind of losing all that. But I find I don't care because I do find that the way that this unfolds is actually a lot of fun. I have a good time with this. Me too. We should talk about, uh, we have a cameo. It's an interesting a- a cameo. It's kind of a big cameo, and it's in the family. It's, uh, yeah, straight out of our our last movie, Robin and Marion. Sean Connery pops up as King Richard at the end, which is a great little surprise. It was. I mean, were you were you surprised? In the theater, yes. Yeah. I was very pleasantly surprised, and I was, I remember watching with a buddy who, uh, the, you know, Sean Connery was his favorite actor, and he just, like, flipped out when that happened, because this was, I think, shortly after Hunt for Red October, and so it was just, you know, it was so fun just seeing him pop up right there. That's right. I mean, it was Hunt for Red October and uh, The Russia House. I was a big fan of The Russia House, and then, uh, uh, I don't know when it was released, but Highlander 2 was also a 1991 film. Um, and he was, he was back in that. Uh, so I, yeah, I mean, I was, of course, uh, yeah, oh, and of uh, Indiana Jones, the last crusade was 89. So, uh, you know, uh, Sean yeah, Connery right. was huge, huge in our, in our brains. Uh, so seeing him, and I'm sure like that is, it was just such an easy pick, uh, especially because the producers obviously knew his legacy of Robin, uh, that it would make a nice twist for folks like my dad who yeah, right, right. loved it. What do you think of uh, Kevin Reynolds as a director? So I, I feel like he has a history of making these really big mo- moment movies that are great for trailers and posters that can be a lot of fun if you go into it with that with the right mindset. And I think he has a real stamp. Like, I look at this movie and I can absolutely see the the sort of Michael Bay style of impression on the film. and. So he's consistent. He's consistent with, you know, change the clothes out between Robin Hood and Waterworld and you might have, uh, you'll have a lot of similar beats. You'll have people hanging from their necks and things like it's, you have a lot of uh, similar beats. So I, I, I like him in terms of what he's able to deliver. But if I think too hard about it, these aren't movies that I, I watch a whole lot. Yeah, I think that's something with him. I, I find him to be a very Hollywood director in a way that I don't necessarily um, find him very memorable. But uh, And he hasn't directed a lot of stuff. I mean, he's only made nine films. The last one was uh, Risen in 2016, which uh, I don't even remember hearing about that one. That was uh, with, oh, that's where Joseph Fiennes plays. Um, uh, it, it's in Jesus's time. I don't know the story. Um, but I'm sure it's about Jesus rising. <laughs> I was just going to say, I bet you know the story. <laughs> yeah, right. Um, but like The Count of Monte Cristo, I think, you know, there was, I mean, that's a, a book that I really love. I think that film, it was very Hollywoodized and very simplified. And I, I find that about him. And I, I think his his filmmaking is very energetic and fun. And I think he's playing around with the camera in ways that make for kind of uh, just fun times. But as I as I look at it a little more critically, I'm like, you know, it's kind of sloppy. The camera work, sometimes it's not motivated. Like some of his shots that he throws in there, like some odd, like um, really wide angle close-ups of people, uh, sometimes even just like looking right into the camera, like, you know, first person POV sorts of shots. And like, they're just, they seem to be kind of thrown in sometimes. I'm like, what is up with these odd stylings that he's doing? And I, but I, but I still think that he's, he's a very energetic filmmaker. And if you just watch this film and let it go by, it's very fun and easy and you have a great time. But as you really start looking at it and breaking it down, you realize, you know, there's some, there's some mess in here. He's not the, he's not the cleanest of filmmakers. Well, and I don't think that he's necessarily leading a particularly, uh, or, or or I should say, directing with a, a a terribly strict production hand, too. Right after the shoot, there is just some straight up sloppiness in cutting. There's some just it, it just 
uh, if you watch it too closely, right? Thank goodness we're not doing it minute by minute because my goodness, there's a lot to pull apart. You know, uh, continuity errors all over the place if you look too hard. Um, and uh, and so I find some of those things frustrating on we on rewatch. But uh, it, one of the things that I think he does really well is pick the right. Uh, certainly pick the right composers. Uh, and in this case, um, he is able to take what is a middling, you know, uh, action adventure movie and make it an incredibly emotionally manipulative, uh, in a good way, uh, Robin Hood adventure, thanks to, for me, Michael Kamen's script or uh, score. Yeah, I, I mean, I 100% agree with that. I think this is one of those those film scores that uh, was one of the first ones I think I probably bought the album for and listened to endlessly. I just yeah. loved the music. I had that album that had like the art, <laughs> you know, it just, it, just, it was a, a fantastic thing to listen to. And I just loved it. Um, and it really, I think that might be, I, I was thinking about this other than like the John Williams, Star Wars and Superman music. It probably was this score that kind of, uh, kind of opened the doorway for me into my addiction to uh, film scores and soundtracks because it just is so memorable. The theme is just so beautiful. Both of the the, the adventure theme is re- incredibly rousing, and the the romance uh, theme is just is is just touching and beautiful. I think Michael Kamen just did a beautiful job with it, and and so much so that Morgan Creek um, uses the, the the main title for uh, their logo music, which I think right. is hilarious. It, it's one of those, it, there's a wonderful interview where he talks about how he does it. It's an interesting interview. It was one of those like televised, you know, hour long things that came out the history of Robin Hood in partnership with this movie. And it was hosted by Pierce Brosnan. Uh, right. Did you see this one? Uh, I did. It it made me laugh because it, it all I could think about was, you know who I could see as Robin Hood in 1991? It's Pierce Brosnan. <laughs> That's the guy I would love to see in this movie. Hearing Michael Kamen talk about just what the orchestras love is that, you know, the orchestras love playing all out. It's like getting on a horse and riding all out across this field. They're in a big chase. And this score delivers that time and time and again. To your point about the the score that got you into scores, it was actually another Michael Kamen score that got me uh, into this. So I was already conditioned. Mm for this score because of his immediate previous score. Do you know what that was? His immediate previous score from 19, 1991. You're looking it up. If you have to look it up, you don't I'm know not me looking very it well. up. I'm not looking it up. My hands are right here. Let's see. It's not Lethal Weapon because that was several years before. Although we should 91. say both Die Hard, Lethal Weapon, Lethal Weapon 2, Die Hard 2, a- exceptional lead up to, to this movie. Um, well, with all of that, what you just said, now it makes me think that it's that uh, Hudson Hawk movie. <laughs> Nobody calls it that, that Hudson <laughs> Hawk movie. It is revered, you twit. But I got it, didn't I? <laughs> you did. You had help. I didn't. I love that score. I love it. Yeah. It actually has some good tracks. It's it's pretty good. Yeah, it's Great. How's Brian Williams, uh, Brian Williams, Brian Adams work for you in the movie? <laughs> not as much, uh, not as much. And in fact, like it's, it's almost. Is it, is it the song itself? Like the, that's during the credits or, or just the, the fact that you don't like Brian Adams? The fact that no, the, it's the song was overplayed. That, that's really the problem. I mean, it's probably, it's a fine song. It's super dated to me. It's got, it's musical styling is just super dated right now. And, and so I struggle with that. Um, Brian Adams, of course, uh, as the balladeer in the movie. What a mistake having that happen. Yeah, and I think he he brought his whole band. Like everybody's in the movie and it's that well, was not. And they're singing a song Wild Times, which is like <sighs> I I heard that I'm like why are they this is so out of place all of a sudden. Yeah. That just that threw me out. I'm glad to hear that that is a thing that you can at least be broken in some parts by this movie. I'm relieved. So, anyhow, I I feel like he was it, the song got way too much radio play and and it's fine. I still love it. Oh, Andy. But it, but it it just it's it yeah it's of the time it i is. love it for yeah. the time it's certainly you're right it's dated and it's uh you know but i don't know it's fine for me I, it works in context of this movie all of it fits because of the way that they built the shell yeah and because it's so enjoyable it's hard to get for me it's hard to get to uh, get my panties in a bunch too much over it so 
How to do an award season, Andrew? This was one of those movies that had its categories that were the ones that it was getting nominated for. It had 16 wins, 23 other nominations. Um, at the Academy Awards, Best Song, Everything I Do, I Do It For You, was nominated, Pete, your favorite. Mm. It lost to the song Beauty and the Beast from the film Beauty and the Beast. I buy that. This was that year where it had Beauty and the Beast had three songs nominated for, for best original song. And uh, the only other two uh, were this, and I forgot to look at what the other one was. But um, yeah, this is, a, it was going to be a hard year to um, to get on top of Beauty and the Beast. Yeah. At the Golden Globes, it was nominated for Best Original Score and Best Song. Both of those lost to Beauty and the Beast. Um, this is a note, Pete, that I have here because we talked about Rush quite a long time ago. But this is where the Eric Clapton song Tears in Heaven came from, and it was nominated for a Golden Globe. And I just wanted to put it to you. Tears in Heaven, Beauty and the Beast, or Everything I Do, I Do It For You. Tears in Heaven. Okay. You? That's a pretty good song. I like it quite a bit. I probably would pick Tears in Heaven over Beauty and the Beast, as much as I love the music in that film. Yeah, I just think... I, but I, Tears in Heaven, yeah. is it's a heartbreaking song. Heartbreaking. Exceptional song. Yeah. At the BAFTAs, Alan Rickman did win Best Supporting Actor. Costume Design had a nomination, but lost to the French film Cyrano de Bergerac, which I think is a fair uh, a fair trade there. That's a great film. At the Saturn Awards, we, we like those. Uh, the Best Fantasy Film, it got a nomination for that, but lost to Edward Scissorhands. Best Actor, Kevin Costner, he lost to Anthony Hopkins for Silence of the Lambs. This is a funny one. Best Supporting Actor, Alan Rickman, he lost to William Sadler for Bill and Ted's Bogus Journey. William Sadler, like really need to do, who played yeah. like Satan, played Death. Death, right, right, yeah, death. Yeah. right. I haven't seen it, but uh, I feel like we're going to need to do a Bill and Ted's series now that the third one's coming out. That's that's an easy one. Yeah, uh, Best Supporting Actress Mary Elizabeth Master Antonio. She lost to Mercedes Rule for The Fisher King, which I think is uh, a fair a loss right there. Totally. And Best Costumes uh, lost to The Rocketeer, which. Um, I hear people like that movie, so... Whoa, 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 you whoa. Go. You've not the seen The Rocketeer? The costumes were great. No, I have seen The Rocketeer. Oh. I'm just saying. I hear people like it. It's positive. It's a positive... It's a It's a movie people like. <laughs> I don't know what I'm trying to say. Well, what, what you're saying in subtext is it's not a movie that you like, and that needs to be rectified. So. It's a movie I think is okay. I think it's okay. Um, speaking to the song, though, it had nine nominations total, and four of those were wins. So it was a popular song for its time. Now, mm -hmm. I do have the Razzie nominations, Pete, and you should be happy to know Kevin Costner was nominated for Worst Actor, and he won! <laughs> <laughs> Anywhere in their uh, win announcement, did they make any allusions to the word flat or one-dimensional <laughs> or... Anything? Oh, uh, they didn't. Uh, I didn't see that, but All I'm right. sure that they probably did. And then Christian Slater was nominated for the worst supporting actor uh, uh, for this film and Mobsters, but he lost to Dan Aykroyd for the film Nothing But Trouble. I can also say that's probably a earned win <laughs> or loss, however or you want to find right. the Razzies. <laughs> right. How to do at the box office? Well, fresh on the heels of his Oscar wins for Dances with Wolves, Costner could pretty much get the budgets he wanted. And for this one, he got a massive $50 million budget, which is about $94 million in today's dollars, and which is almost as much as was spent on Taron Edgerton's recent version, $99 million, in case you're wondering. And also, in case you're wondering, there is still one more Robin Hood film that is more than double that amount, but we will get to that one soon enough. This movie was released June 14th, 1991, and had the weekend to itself, barring a few limited art house releases. People were smart enough not to take Costner head on, after all. It opened in the number one spot, but only held onto it for two weeks before getting bumped to the number two spot by the Naked Gun Two and a Half, The Smell of Fear, of all things. And with Terminator 2 opening just the weekend after that, there was really no chance for it to get back to the top. Regardless, the movie did incredibly well for itself, earning $165.5 million domestically and $225 million everywhere else, making a grand total of $734 million in today's dollars. And it was actually the number two film of the year after T2. 
That makes this the most profitable Robin Hood film we are talking about in this series, but also the most profitable Robin Hood film, period. It landed with an adjusted profit per finished minute of almost $4.5 million. But it still, as I said, only landed as the number two film of 91 behind T2. You can't win them all. Do you think you just spoiled something? The most Maybe. profitable Robin Hood film, period. I probably did. Yeah. Spoiler wow. alert. <laughs> for anyone who is listening to this show, primarily for budgetary news, then you've just been spoiled. <laughs> Should we rank it? Let's do it. Head over to flickchart.com slash the next reel. You'll see all of the movies that we've talked about on this show. Uh, if you swipe over in your show notes and you tap the word flick chart, you'll be visited onto this movie in the flick chart catalog where you can add it to your own list and see how it stands up against ours. All right. First up, we have Robin Hood, Prince of Thieves or Murder on the Orient Express. Murder on the Orient Express, please. Robin Hood, please. Hmm. We're going we're gonna to do it like that. I'm surprised that uh, you would put on murder first. <laughs> Are you? And they're both. I, honestly, um, uh, I could be fairly easily swayed. I, I'm kind of right there in the middle. You have Kevin Costner, the, the best shot in the film. Kevin Costner shooting an arrow that's on fire with an explosion raging behind yeah, him. That's very in sexy. slow motion. It's beautiful. You're right. You don't have any of that. I'm going to give it to you, Andy. I'm going to give it to you. Even though the shot immediately before that, there are no fire flames behind him. They're very, very small. There are. There's, wee a, flames. there's a huge explosion going on. <laughs> All, right, All right. Let's see where we go here. Right. Robin Hood, Prince of Thieves, or Fargo. 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 Robin Hood, Prince of Thieves, or Mother. Mother. Mother, please. Robin Hood, Prince of Thieves, or Thank You for Smoking. Thank you for smoking. Thank you for smoking. Robin Hood, Prince of Thieves, or Autumn Sonata. Oh. I'm curious where you're going to go with this one. I was kind of hoping you'd answer first. Well, um, I'm Robin Hood. You are? Really? I mean, Autumn Sonata is a good film, but Robin Hood is is very entertaining. I would put that on you first. You definitely sure. put that on first. Okay, I'll go with that logic. Robin Hood, Prince of Thieves, or The Departed? Probably The Departed, but I could be moved. I'm going to say The Departed. All right. You don't have to be moved. Robin Hood, Prince of Thieves, or The Thomas Crown Affair, 1968. Oh, jeez. They're both of their time. They are really of their time, aren't they? I, I probably lean toward Robin Hood. I am leaning toward Thomas Crown. Why? Doom buggies. <laughs> sexy chess. <laughs> oh, sexy chess. Mmm. <laughs> You know what we got in Robin Hood was sexy repelling, and that is nowhere near as sexy as sexy chess. <laughs> I'm going to go with Thomas Crown. All right, there it is. Robin Hood, Prince of Thieves, or High Noon? High Noon. <sighs> I I feel like I'm going to say Robin Hood. I, I had so many more issues with High Noon. Yeah, I mean, you know. I owe it a rewatch, but still, I'll say Robin Hood. Yeah, I'm going to... I'm I am... Uh, I think firmly with Cooper on this one. All right, you swayed me. <laughs> you didn't sell me. <laughs> I didn't sell you. I just this is just the power of influence. Exactly. Tony Robbins to me. I did. <laughs> <laughs> Robin Hood, Prince of Thieves, or Creep Show? Creep Show. Creep Show. Absolutely. Well, that lands Robin Hood, Prince of Thieves, in spot one ninety five on our chart. One ninety five. Interestingly, it is just a couple spots above the uh, a, a different Robin Hood. But unfortunately, they're all named Robin Hood, so I can't tell which <laughs> one it is. I don't know what they are. It is actually the animated one. It is two spots above the animated film. So 195 out of 415. That lands it, um, you know, pretty good spot on a chart. It's about uh, right in the middle, 53%. Well, I would love to tell you uh, how it did on my own chart, but flick chart is totally frozen for me. So, and you didn't do it. I did. It's done. Oh wow! But I didn't okay. redo it. Oh dear! Can you give me a second? Or should this? Should I share the drama? It's boring drama. No, no, no. I well, I, it's boring drama. But let me just say before I cut away. Currently, before I re rank this, when I first ranked the movie and then ranked a whole bunch of other stuff, this ended up at one forty six out of one eleven hundred movies on my flick chart. Wow. Okay. Now. Cue the interstitial music. 
哒哒哒哒哒哒哒哒哒哒哒哒哒哒哒哒哒哒哒哒哒哒哒哒哒哒哒哒哒哒哒哒哒哒哒哒哒哒哒哒哒哒哒哒哒哒哒哒哒哒哒哒哒哒哒哒哒哒哒哒哒哒哒哒哒哒哒哒哒哒哒哒哒哒哒哒哒哒哒哒哒哒哒哒哒哒哒哒哒哒哒哒哒哒哒哒哒哒哒哒哒哒哒哒哒哒哒哒哒哒哒哒I'll tell you, Andy. That's kind of where I am. Okay. How does it on yours? Are is it two and a half a, with a like or two and a half? I'm like? definitely going to give it a like, but it's exactly in the middle okay. of the road. Good Friday, Saturday night movie night. Uh, some really fun beats and performances, and uh, two and a half with a like. I, what's yours? I, let's see if you you can uh, sway me. Oh, I, I don't need to sway you here because it's just where it is. Mine actually, before I re ranked it, was at thirteen eighty three out of forty one ninety three. And then it actually went up on my chart. It went to 723. So it landed at about an 83% on my chart. Okay. And it tells me it should be about a four out of five. And that's where I put it. I have a lot of fun with this one. Four, four stars and a heart. Five. Genius. This is one of those movies where I have so much fun yeah. that I find myself being very forgiving of a lot of the issues I have with it. Now, will it it will it hold up if I watch it in a few months and re-rank it, or will it fall? I don't know. But well, the answer to that is time, you don't rewatch it in a few months. <laughs> don't right. do that. Let it don't live where it lives. Up. It sounds great right, right. now. Uh, this is great. Where do we? Uh, so that closes out uh, Costner's Costnerhood. Uh, where do we go from here? Not very far. No, not very far at all. This is the shortest jump, I think, that we will have. Uh, I know that we will have in this whole series because we are jumping a, a mere month or a few months away to an interesting Robin Hood uh, tale that was made that uh, did not really get much of a release because of this one. This is that period where there was this battle of projects and there happened to be two actually i heard them saying that there were actually at one point three robin hood projects being developed at this particular point in time um these are the two that survived and the one that we just watched robin hood prince of thieves and the one that we will be watching uh, for next week it is just called robin hood and um yeah i know this film exists and I've never seen it. I've always been curious about it, but it's not one I've sought out before. Patrick Bergen plays Robin, and Uma Thurman is uh, Maid Marian. And uh, so, yeah, John Irvin directed it. I'm very curious about it. What do you think? I'm you very curious about it. I'm, I'm, I am excited, especially after this one. Although it, it is a 5.8 on the IMDb stick star yeah. scale. I'm not. Yeah. I'm not, uh, you know, I'm exactly 5.8 stars excited about it. So uh, I'm very <laughs> curious. I'm a full 10 stars curious. Yeah, me too. I, I'm really curious. This will be an interesting one to kind of close out the 90s. Well, the, not the, the 90s, but the 91s Robin yeah. Hoods for me. Because I've always been curious. <laughs> we shall see. Uh, very excited about it. We are, uh, what else do we have going on right now that we need to tell the people about? Well, we're doing our hiatus episodes for the Marvel Movie Minute. We've had one or two come out now for The Incredible Hulk, some of the the Incredible Hulk uh, TV movies we're talking about. So those are fun. We'll be releasing those about every three weeks or so between now and the end of the year. Gearing up for our January start of season two with The Incredible Hulk, uh, a much maligned MCU film that will be really fun to talk about and dig into. Uh, I will say that uh, if you missed the film board episode last month on Where'd You Go, Bernadette, you would not know the announcement that the next film board episode is It Chapter 2. Somehow, they've got wow. JJ <laughs> willing to go see this movie in the theater where he cannot escape. So uh, the guys did a great job making sure that he couldn't speak as they were picking the movie somehow. And so I'm very much looking forward to that show. So that means he also is going to have to go watch It Chapter One. <laughs> yes, it does. <laughs> wow. Yes. So to Steve and Tommy, uh, little, little my hat's JJ off. Growing up. Yeah. Hats <laughs> off. Well, good. I will update the letterbox with that. That's right. When the movie ends, our conversation begins. Am 
Amazon giveth, Andy. As Amazon always doeth. I love it when Amazon and the algorithm uh, actually agree so thoroughly with you. A lot of very positive <laughs> reviews, right at right around three or four stars. Uh, people are very excited. Uh, so I was less than thrilled. So I went up and you went down. Where would you like to start? Let's end on a high note. I got a one star by Milk Dudsky, who says poorly acted. Lead characters grin when the scene calls for sorrow. How does anyone believe this is a great film? <laughs> That's it? That's it. Even, Short and sweet. Even I uh, like the movie better than that. Uh, <laughs> I have one from Teresa, who says, five stars, the very end. It is a movie. Good for both lady and gent. Every moment, air quote, hangs one in suspense. All I can add without giving something away is buy it. You, as I, will need to see it much more than one time. <laughs> I don't know why we hang. I think she was she was alluding to some a plot element, possibly. There are some Especially hanging with the things. Air yeah. Thank wow. You, yes. Okay. It's good for both lady and gent. That's my favorite part. <laughs> And also, it's a it's a shill. Like it's good for but and buy it. And that was all caps. Right. I needed to just buy it. I think she should say Amazon employee instead of verified. Do you think that's purchase. Kevin Costner actually? It could be. You know, it'd be a shame if it was like Master Antonio. Like if this is what she's doing with her time now is writing Amazon reviews in loose. Buy, buy this movie, please buy my movies. Ah, oh, that's just a sad this note. Took a dark Thanks. turn. Thanks for nothing, Amazon. It's hard to believe we have been having in-depth weekly conversations about movies since 2011. Oh, you're telling me. Producing this show week after week is so much fun, but it does require a ton of work behind the scenes. If you'd like to help support our efforts, one easy way is by using our Originals page when shopping for books and movies that we've covered. Your purchases made through our links give us a small commission at no extra cost to you and allow us to keep having these great discussions. We are highlighting adaptations from Season 9 over at our Originals page, thenextreel.com slash originals. That's the site where listeners can purchase the source material for all of our adapted film discussions. We had a big Robin Hood series this season, looking at nine different versions on screen. Many were likely adapted from Howard Pyle's The Merry Adventures of Robin Hood, including Douglas Fairbanks in Robin Hood, The Adventures of Robin Hood, Disney's Robin Hood, Robin Hood Prince of Thieves, and the 1991 Robin Hood, and Ridley Scott's Robin Hood. Robin and Marion was specifically based on the ballad, The Jest of Robin Hood. And we really don't have too much to say about Robin and the Seven Hoods. We talked Dead Ringers for our David Cronenberg series adapted from Barry Wood and Jack Geisland's novel, Twins. Have you checked out that show? You know, I haven't, but I've heard great things. Two comedies from our Steve Martin series were adaptations, Pennies from Heaven from the BBC series, and The Lonely Guy from the book by Bruce J. Friedman. The Best Little Whorehouse in Texas was part of our Colin Higgins series, adapted from the Broadway musical. Spike Lee brought us Black Klansman from Ron Stallworth's memoir. And we looked at a trio of John Le Carey adaptations, The Spy Who Came In From The Cold, The Little Drummer Girl, and Tinker Tailor Soldier Spy. Plus, all three movies in our Agnieszka Holland series were based on books, Europa Europa, In Darkness, and Spore. La Caja Fall and its remake, The Birdcage, both came from Jean Poiret's original play. We also talked about Arsenic and Old Lace and Charade in our Gary Grant series. All of these were based on other material, and it is all available on our Originals page, thenextreel.com slash originals. Every book purchased supports the podcast. Get the full list of adaptations we've covered and start your next read today at thenextreel.com slash originals. Originals.